Greetings and welcome back to room 303 of AP English. And we now turn in our study of the Odyssey to book number 8, A Day for Songs and Contest, is how Fagel calls this uh, chapter. This is a really important chapter book for us in the Odyssey because it takes us back to our study of the Iliad book 23 and the games of Achilles. This is the great book of art. It's one of the reasons I love to teach this book. We will have art, though, defined in a multiplicity of ways. Sports, songs and poetry, dancing, storytelling, and of course setting up books 9 through 12, the great story of Odysseus and this, that big flashback scene. Let's just review where we've been. If you haven't been following me on LearnStrong.net, the AP folder, I've already given lectures on books 1 through 7. Let's just review those books quickly. The first four books, of course, the Telemache, telling the story of Telemachus. In book 1, we have the invocation of the muse. We learned that Odysseus is a man of twists and turns. Athena, as Mentis, will go to Ithaca, will tell Telemachus, the young son of, uh, of Odysseus, it's time to grow up at line 350. In book 2, we have Telemachus calling the assembly. Doesn't work out well for him. He's mocked by the suitors. We have the eagle's sign where they're fighting in the sky, and then Telemachus will leave with Mentor as his guide, of course, Athena. In book three, Telemachus will arrive on Pylos, where he will meet Nestor, the great warrior hero of the Iliad, and there as well, Athena will be changed into the eagle. Nestor will tell him, you have great friends, and Nestor will serve up um, his son, uh, um, um, Pisisterus, to uh, Telemachus for help, and off they go to find Menelaus and Helen. Book four is, of course, with Menelaus and Helen. We have that amazing scene where Helen will drug the men, she will, and, and Menelaus will tell stories about Odysseus. We hear from Proteus, and so does Telemachus, that in fact Odysseus is still alive. Meanwhile, back on Ithaca, we're told at the very end of the Telemache, at the end of book four, that the suitors are ready to plot to kill Telemachus, and that Penelope, his mother, is beside herself with grief and worry. Book five, we find Odysseus for the first time on Calypso's island. Calypso is told by Hermes, it's time to let him go. She's not pleased, but she lets it happen. On a raft he goes, Poseidon sees Odysseus on the raft and tries to drown him. I know with the uh, special scarf will help him get to the island of the Phaeacians. In book six, we will have Odysseus with Nausicaa, who is the daughter of Al Alcinius, the uh, king of the Phaeacians. We have these two great rhetorical speeches, one by Odysseus and one by Nausicaa. And then Nausicaa will give Odysseus the information about when you go into the palace, make sure you go up directly to my mother, Aerte, and make sure that she's the one you speak to and make supplication for. In book seven, the island of the Phaeacians is like Eden. It's very Edenic. It's like El Dorado. It's perfect. It's in every way. It's heaven on earth. Odysseus will, in fact, go as supplicant to Arete. He will eat. He will sleep. And then we are ready for the beginning of book eight. Now, the idea here, as I've said before, is that you're using my lecture as an aid that you're reading your own. I would challenge you to read this book. It's a, it's a remarkable book in so many ways. Um, Emphasizing our learning theory again, we're connecting new information to old information in meaningful ways. We do that in our annotative approach by answering three guiding questions. At level one, what does the text say? Summary. At level two, what does the text mean here? Themes, messages at 2A, and of course the rhetoric, not what Homer says, but how he says it at 2B. We're concentrating in our rhetorical study on symbolism and irony. At level three, we try to answer the question, how can I relate this information in any way to my own life? First of all, at 3A, how do I relate it to other texts? We, of course, are challenging ourselves to relate to the Iliad since we've studied the Iliad closely, and then, of course, other texts as well. Finally, at 3B, we'll ask the question, how can I relate to this, this information to me personally? Let's do a real quick overview, as we've done in all of our prior lectures. First of all, we have Athena roaming the town of the Phaeacians, telling everybody, you need to come and look at this amazing stranger, Odysseus. We then have Alcyonus the king, and Alcinius is going to say, let's get 52 of our best men to prepare the ship and to sail Odysseus to his homeland, Ithaca. The irony, of course, will be that these 52 men will never make it back to Phaeacia uh, alive, because uh, uh, Poseidon will kill all of them. It's the tragedy, right? Then Alcinous will say, let's feast, 
Um, again, this is a text that celebrates eating and meals, right? We then have uh, Democritus, and Democritus is this uh, blind bard who will, in many ways, remind us of Homer himself. He will sing a great song of Odysseus and Achilles and a falling out that they had. And Odysseus, in fact, will cry. Alcinous will see that uh, when Democritus is singing um, that uh, Odysseus is crying. Here, of course, already, the power of a good story, the power of art is being emphasized. We then, in the middle of this book, will have this, it's kind of bizarre, these Olympic, mini Olympic games, okay? It reminds us a lot of the Iliad 23 and the Achilles' games. We have a foot race, we have wrestling. Of course, you'll remember that in book 23 of the Iliad, Odysseus and Ajax um, wrestle to a standstill, right? We have um, jumping, um, we have discus throwing, we have boxing. All of this um, is, uh, is very quickly kind of explained as one way, one more way for Alcinius to show just what an amazing country it is that, is, it, that they have. We then have this interesting interlude exchange between the son of Alcinius, um, Laodomedus, um, and he will invite Odysseus to join in. We then have this interesting guy named um, uh, Brosia, and Brosia will uh, taunt Odysseus and call an old man and say, you're not able to compete. Odysseus will say, you ought to learn how to respect your elders, and then he picks up the heaviest or the largest of the discs, throws it over their heads, f um, goes further than anyone else. The marker, who is Athena in disguise, says, nobody will be able to throw this thing further, and then Odysseus will challenge all of the men, except for uh, Laodamus, who, of course, he says is his host, and that would be a violation of Xenia, right? We then will have this amazing dancing scene where uh, Democritus is again, the blind poet is brought in and um, he will sing this song about um, how the wife of Hephaestus, the god, the lame god, the god, the smithy god, um, Aphrodite and Ares are messing around and Hephaestus wants to catch them doing it so he makes this elaborate um, trap and he catches them and then he calls out to all the gods and goddesses and the gods come, goddesses don't because of modesty issues and then he has this interesting exchange with them. It, th this story works on a number of counts as we'll point out in a bit. Think of it. Hephaestus will lose um, uh, will have another another male Ares messing around with his wife Aphrodite. Think of it. Menelaus will have Paris messing around with Helen. Agamemnon will have Aegisthus who will mess around with Clytemnestra, his wife, which will lead to obviously to the question: What about Odysseus and the suitors? And of course, Penelope. Will she remain true? Will she remain faithful? We then have this amazing ball dance kind of thing described. It's almost like the uh, slam dunk contest in the NBA All Star Weekend, where they jump really high into the air and all of that, right? Um, and Odysseus will say, I've never seen anything like it. Here we will have the joining of story and dance together for high art, right? Um, Alcinus then will practice Xenia. He will say all 12 of the major peers of Phaeacia, along with himself and his wife Arete, will give gifts to Odysseus the stranger. They don't know it's Odysseus. That's huge for your notes, right? They then will uh, bathe Odysseus, and once Odysseus comes out from his bath, he'll have the one final exchange with Nausicaa at line 515. She will, in fact, use language that's remarkable. She will say, you owe me for saving your life. And the same word gets used that's used in Iliad 10, 442, when Dolan will say to Odysseus, you owe him. And, of course, Odysseus will jack Dolan's head off. Here, Odysseus will not take up Nausicaa's, you owe me, as in I should, uh, you ought to allow me to be your wife. But rather, he says, I'll always remember you when I go home and pray for you. We then come back one more time to Democus's, um the blind broth, the, the blind bard, and Odysseus making a comment about how bards or poets are the most important uh, the great poet Shelley in his defense of poetry loved the ideas that are being presented as well by Odysseus that bards are the most important. You'll remember I mentioned already that Odyssey 22, line 360, we have Odysseus saving the famous Phemius bard um, instead of hacking his head off the way he does the priest. In the story, The Fall of Troy is told, we mention the, the, the wooden horse again. This is the second mention, right? Book 4, line 305, with Helen's story was the other one. And again, Odysseus cries, leading Alcinius to again say to Odysseus, who are you? And what's up with these tears? Did you know somebody at the walls of Troy? Did you lose somebody at the walls of Troy, etc.? Right? Um, he then mentions, interesting, just as a side note, that there's this old story about how Poseidon someday will jack the Phaeacians. But he says, it's not a big deal. And then he says, tell us your story. Of course, Odysseus will tell the story. This will be the third part. We are now finishing the second part of the Odyssey. The third part will be books 9 through 12. And of course, the famous flashback scene. Now, 
I, I say this every time, dude. I would love to read all of the all of each of these books. I just can't. I don't have the uh, time. So we're going to move quickly now, and I want to at least take a look at a few of the key lines. Let's begin with Athena inviting all of the Phaeacian men and women to come to the castle. And look at this amazing stranger starting at line 11. She says, come this way, you lords and captains of Phaeacia. Come to the meeting grounds and learn about the stranger. I love that it, the word learn here because this is a poem about learning. Odysseus learns, everyone else in the poem learns, and a lot of the learning, of course, happens through storytelling, right? A new arrival here at Wise King's uh, Palace now. He's here from roving the ocean, driven far off course. He looks like a deathless god, rousing their zeal, their curiosity. Stories raise curiosity and wonder. We'll definitely see that here. Each and every man, and soon enough the assembly seats were filled with people thronging, gazing in wonder at the seasoned man of war. Now this man of war thing is going to be fascinating when, for example, He's sitting in the athletic contest and he's taunted as not being an athlete, right? And Odysseus will say, yeah, I, I know a thing or two about contests, right? Alcinus then will um, call for his 52 at line um, 52, uh, the best man at line 40. Come, my people, haul a black ship down to the Black Sea, the, to the black sea raped uh, for her maiden voyage. Enlist a crew of 52 young soldiers, the best in town, who've proved their strength before. Let all hands lash their oars to the thwarts and then disembark. Come to my house and fall in for a banquet quickly. I'll lay on a princely feast for all. The ironies, again, are dark here because these 52 crew will be lost, turned to stone by, of course, Poseidon to pay back. We're then told that the inspired bard, uh, Democritus, will, uh, then, um, will then show up. And um, we're told at line 50, God has given the man the gift of song to him beyond all other things, the power to please. However, the spirit stirs him on to sing. Now, we've said this in earlier lectures before. The Greeks understood a tripartite view in regards to art. First, there are the gods. They are, of course, immortal, and usually they know a whole lot more than humans. Then there are humans who are, of course, mortal and know blessed little. In between are the poets, the artists, those who have been inspired. And the idea is that the gods inspire the poet artist through the muse, and then that poet artist will then share those secrets and that information with humans, making poets very important within the Homeric tradition. Of course, it would make sense that Homer himself, one of the great poets, right? We then will have uh, Democritus, who will come in for the first time. At line 73, leading along the faithful bard, the herald, the muse adored above all others, true for her gifts were mixed with good and evil both. She stripped him of sight, so he's blind, but gave the man the power of stirring rapturous songs. So notice he's blessed and he's cursed, just like Cassandra in the Iliad, blessed to tell the truth, cursed that nobody believes. Here it's blindness, right? And of course, this whole notion about being blind and yet seeing, we know this from our Tiresias study, we know this from our Oedipus study as well, right? We're told again the mantra of the Odyssey that all reached at line 86 for the good things that lay at hand. And when they had put aside desire for food and drink, the muse inspired the bard to sing the famous deeds of fighting heroes, the song whose fame had reached the skies those days, the strife between Odysseus and Achilles, P uh, Peleus' son, how once the gods, lavish feast, the captains clashed in a savage war of words, while Agamemnon, Agamemnon lord of armies, rejoiced at heart that Achaea's bravest men were battling so. This will take us back to the Iliad. We saw this several times, that it does seem that at times Agamemnon enjoys seeing his own men fighting. Maybe it's a sign that they're ready to go and fight Trojans, right? For this was the victory sign that Apollo prophesied at his shrine in Patho when Agamemnon strode across the rocky threshold asking the oracle for advice. The start of the tidal waves of ruin tumbling down on Troy's and Achaea's forces both at once, thanks to the will of Zeus who rules the world, taking us back to the Iliad as well, the will of Zeus at the very opening lines of the invocation of the muse. The other thing I want to point out that's ironic about this is that we are witnessing in Phaeacia the end of the, the, the uh, pastoral, beautiful Phaeacia. When they take Odysseus back, they will be cursed. This will be referenced at the end of this book as well, right? We then will have Odysseus crying, Alcyonus will see it. Uh, when Alcyonus sees it, he will say, enough with the singing. Let's now have our little, uh, you know, activity um, with, uh, you know, the, um, the uh, um, uh, champions, the young, the young people um, who are going to compete. At line 130 and following, we have a list of those, reminding us of that list in Iliad 2, of, um, uh, of the list of chariots, as it's called, right? We then have... 
um, a series of, of athletic events. We have a foot race, we have a wrestling, we have jumping, we have discus throwing, we have boxing, um, all of this happening roughly line 150. This happens really quickly. Um, Laodamus, the, the son of uh, Alcinous, then will ask Odysseus um, um, to maybe get involved. He says about Odysseus, he's not yet past his prime. And very quickly, we have another character in uh, Brosia who will put in quickly that Laodamus said, uh, right, go up to the fellow, challenge him yourself. And on that cue, then, we'll have the prince saying to Odysseus, come, stranger, sir, won't you try your hand at our contest now if you have any skill in any? It's fit and proper. Uh, these are lines that uh, many athletes love to quote from this book at line 168. It's fit and proper for you to know your sports. What greater glory attends a man while he's alive than what he wins when his racing feet and striving hands? Well, of course, Odysseus understands that there is actually something beyond athletic um, attempts, and that is, of course, trying to save your life in the, in the field of battle, right? Notice the Phaeacians say that the greatest thing you can do is athlete, ath athletics because they've never had contests of war. They've never had to worry about that, right? Come and compare then. Throw your cares to the wind. It won't be long. Your journey's not far off. Your ship's already hauled out of the sea. Your crew is set to sail. In other words, you're about to leave, so why don't you engage in some athletic contests? Leodimus, um, we're told, uh, Odysseus will respond, why do you taunt me so with uh, such a challenge? Pains weigh on my spirit now, not your sports. And then he says it, I've suffered much already, struggling hard. In other words, I've been in battle. Son, I don't, I'm not interested in throwing discs. It doesn't mean anything to me, given what I have lost in, in the field of battle. But here I sit, amid your assembly still, starved for passage home, begging your king, begging all your people. And then Rotsia will speak up, and he says, I knew it. I never took you. Talking about Odysseus. For someone skilled in games, the kind, of, the kind that real men play throughout the world. The, the ironies, of course, are just dripping. Here is Odysseus, who chops off Dolan's head in the Iliad. This is Odysseus, who invents the Trojan horse, and, of course, is a part of the slaughter of the city of Troy. And you have this young kid, Bosia, that's saying, I knew you were a nobody because you, you, you're not involved in, in games as an athlete. Not a chance, he continues. You're some skipper of profiteers roving the high seas in his scudding craft, reckoning up his freight with a keen eye, out for home cargo, grabbling the gold he can. You're no athlete. I see that. Um, two things here. Obviously, we are continuing with that idea that uh, Odysseus is unknown quantity. He will be an unknown quantity to the suitors when he gets home as well, right? And they always underestimate what we're dealing with with Odysseus. A dark glance, Odysseus will come back. He says it at, at, at line 192, you, he says, you're a reckless fool, I see that. Odysseus is classic with his insult. So the gods don't hand out all their gifts at once, not building brains and flowing speech to all. In other words, some men just don't get, don't get a mind. One man may fail to impress us with his looks, but a god can crown his words with beauty, charm, and men look on with delight when he speaks out, never faltering, filled with winning self-control. He shines forth at assembly grounds and people gaze at him like a god when he walks through the streets. We've heard this argument before. Dude, who cares if you can bench press 400 pounds? Do you have a mind to go with it? Because if you don't have a mind to go with it, Odysseus says it's kind of a waste of time. You can be an amazing athlete, but she, by the way, earlier has won in one of the contests, right? Yeah, um, um, we continue, he says, Another man may look like a deathless one on high, but there's not a bit of grace to crown his words, just like you, fine, handsome friend. Not even a god would improve those lovely looks of yours, but the mind inside is worthless. This is that beautiful argument that Odysseus makes. You can be as good-looking as you want to be, but if you don't have a mind to go with it, what difference does it make, right? Your slander fans the anger in my heart, he says, I'm no stranger to sports. We know this because, of course, you all remember in the Iliad 23, he has that famous wrestling match with the great Ajax, and it comes to a standstill, right? For all your taunts, I've held my place in the front ranks, I tell you, long as I could trust to my youth and striving hands. But now I'm wrestled down. It's an interesting bird, right? I'm wrestled down by pain and hardship. Look, I've borne my share of struggles, cleaving my way through wars of men and pounding waves at sea. He doesn't say that he's Odysseus from Troy. He just says, I've been in a lot of wars. Nevertheless, despite so many blows, I'll compete in your games. Just watch. Your insults come to the quick. You rouse my fighting blood. Some have pointed out that this is the moment in the Odyssey when, before the end of the poem, Odysseus most looks like Achilles. Really? Really? You're going to call me out? So what does he do? Well, he picks up the largest disc. He throws it over their heads 
And Athena is the Marx person who says, yeah, not only does he win, but there's nobody like him. And at this, Odysseus, we're told, at, uh, at line uh, 230, the hero laughs. In the Iliad, Achilles smiles in book 23. In the Odyssey, Odysseus laughs. Uh, the poet is definitely trying to join the two poems together, and especially the 23rd uh, book of the Iliad with uh, book 8 of the Odyssey. Then Odysseus will challenge all of them. In fact, he'll say, step right up. He says, I won't challenge my host, but I'll challenge anybody else. And he says, I can handle a bow, which of course is a nice foreshadowing of what will happen to those suitors at the end. He says, um, even, uh, I, he said, I was as good as Philoctetes, and he kind of lets it go that he was at Troy. He says, Philoctetes alone outshot me here, um, there at Troy, uh, when ranks of Achaean archers bent their bows. So this will obviously pike the interest of, oh, you were at Troy? Dude, who are you? Kind of thing, right? He says, I can, I, uh, uh, he says, I, I can rival anybody except for the greatest of heroes like uh, Hercules, he mentions, right? And he says, as for spears, I can win. As for, as for sprinting, he says, I'm not so great at it because my legs have lost their spring, he says, because I've been on a boat for too long. And when he finishes, everybody's dead quiet, and they're all kind of like, oh, no way, right? You can imagine that Bochia is going to be like, uh, uh, Brodicea is going to be like, uh, who, is, who is this guy? It'll be at this point, then, that we have the next movement. Alcinius, then, will fetch uh, Democritus, the great poet, and you're going to have this interesting um, exchange that will happen. The bard is brought in, you have this uh, dancing that's going to happen, and you have this bringing together of multiple genres of, uh, of art. So you'll have the poet singing a song, and you'll have these people, these young men, dancing, doing this amazing dance that Odysseus will say is quite remarkable. The bard song, starting at, um, at, at line 300, is a remarkable one. We're told it's an irresistible song. What's it about? It's a fascinating thing, what the topic is. I don't think anything is lost at all on, on the poet Homer here as he puts this together. The love of Ares and Aphrodite crowned with flowers. How the two had first made love in Hephaestus' mansion, all in secret. Ares had showered her with gifts and showered Hephaestus' marriage bed with shame. But a messenger ran to tell the god of fire, Helios, lord of the sun, who'd spied the couple lost in each other's arms and making love. Hephaestus